Thank you, everybody, for both making it here after lunch and making it upstairs after lunch. The, the combination of the two is actually impressive for a talk. Um, Cool. Intro, we got that out of the way. I started out at ISEC Partners. If you know ISEC Partners or NCC, uh, pen testing, consulting, all sorts of fun with that. Um, moved over to Defense. I was the, the first CISO at Etsy and, and built and ran the four different security groups there. Um, and then several years ago, left with my co-founders and co-founded Signal Sciences to really take those lessons learned at Etsy of an organization going through the shift to DevOps and cloud uh, and making a product that you can drop in to defend your web applications, right? Really take years of engineering effort and pain and turn that into a product that you can drop in and actually defend your, your apps there. Um, cool. What's this talk actually about? Um, in spite of the incredibly long title that managed to use, I think, Sec DevOps, DevOpsSec, and Dev sec ops or something in there it's yeah i tried to go for all of them um it's really about this is a talk i wish i could have given myself eight years ago when i started at etsy of hey you're an organization going through the shift to devops going through the shift to cloud uh what are the lessons learned in terms of how do you need to adapt your sdlc um so a couple years ago actually here at epsa california i gave a very different version of this talk, which was how do you adapt kind of the, the culture of your security team and adapt the culture of interaction with the rest of the organization. This one is kind of the other side of that coin. It's how do we actually adapt our technical controls of the SDLC? So it's, you know, I'll, I'll go through all this, but like how do we adapt the things that we've been doing and the AppSec programs that we've been building to actually be effective in this sort of new world? Um, so I deliberately wrote this talk as like, 30 to 40 minutes so that we would have, A, that you wouldn't have to listen to me talk for that long, uh, which is always a good thing, uh, and B, that we don't have to wait till the end for questions. So please, as you have comments, questions, booing, obscenities, anything, uh, just shout them out or raise your hand or whatever and let's actually dive into stuff. We've got time for that in the talk. Um, so the spoiler alert, yeah, except for you, Manico. You're not, sorry. Every, that applies to everyone except Manico. Um, so the spoiler alert is that security shifts from being this gatekeeper to actually enabling teams to be secure by default. Um, this is, I think, anything that you boil up to one sentence is going to sound cliche, uh, but it doesn't make it untrue, right? This is actually the truth of the way in which we need to adapt our security programs, is we have to enable these teams by default, rather than being this gatekeeper that says, I've got to sign off on everything before it goes live or anything like that. Those days were great, they were the late 90s, uh, and we are not in them anymore. So what has changed? Uh, a bunch of different things. So I'll kind of, this is kind of setting the stage and then I'm gonna go through the different ways in which we adapt the SDLC. Uh, the first is that change happens orders of magnitude faster than it used to. Uh, how many folks lived through, I'm probably dating myself uh, here, but how many folks lived through the waterfall era of software development? Yeah, right? It was an adventure, uh, to say the least. Um, the amount of times that, that I've heard in, in past lives there, like, oh, yeah, that SQL injection fix didn't make it into, uh, into this cycle, so we'll, it'll be live in 24 months. You're like, okay, right, uh, awesome. Uh, compared to where we're going now, which is that you know, organizations that used to deploy every 18 months are now headed towards, they're on this journey to deploying every month or every week or every day or every hour or even less. Um, right, you see the leading organizations deploying 50, 100 times a day, uh, where the leading organizations eight, 10 years ago were deploying once a week and that was considered insane in terms of velocity. Um, and the, from the security perspective, it's that we used to have kind of many injection points into the process, right? If you're releasing every 18 months, well, okay, we can do our design reviews during January, we can do some pen testing in September, uh, we can do the fixes the next February, and we can kind of build like that, to while we were saying that sentence, that code has actually gone live to production. Right? And so you're, the way in which you have time to interact with the team radically changes, which seems super scary at first, by the way, right? Uh, spoiler alert of what I'm gonna get to by the end is that actually this makes us safer. This actually is a net positive on security. Um, 
And then the, the decentralized ownership of deployment, right? It used to be, used to go down the, the Oregon trail of dev to QA to security to uh, back to dev to sysops to prod. Uh, it becomes dev to production. And so the, the change here is not that these other steps go away. If those are all going away, like something has gone catastrophically off the rails, uh, what changes is that now the, the other facets that used to belong in there, so security, QA, anything like that, performance testing, that needs to be available to the development team and to the DevOps team so that they can, they can do that as part of their job. Um, and the, the link down here is actually the, the talk that I gave here two years ago on how we need to shift the culture along with these, these uh, technology shifts as well. So the new reality in this is that security cannot be outsourced to anymore, right? In the, the waterfall world, it was you have all these groups that kick it over, kick you know, a code drop or whatever over the fence to another group. So, oh, I wrote some code, I kick it to QA. They kick it to another group to, to fix there. Uh, and then it gets kicked over to sysops to deploy to production and it's in production 12 months after that developer actually wrote the code. And then the security issue gets discovered and you go back to the developer and they're like, yeah, I don't know, that was 15 months ago. Like, I don't, I don't remember what I was doing on vacation then, let alone like the code I wrote. Um, so the, the real mission of security, it changes from being this outsourced group to handle it for you to actually security's entire job in this modern world is to be able to make different development teams and DevOps teams security self-sufficient. That's our focus now. Um, is It's not trying to, hey, we're going to come in and fix everything for you. It's here's how you can actually build secure systems by yourself. And then security becomes this kind of services organization to help on top of that. Um, security, put another way, it really only becomes successful in this DevOps, cloud, agile world uh, if it can bake into the development and the DevOps process. So technical diagrams coming up. Uh, how does legacy, how do legacy AppSec approaches actually fare if you take our SDLC approach from 10 years ago and you try to drop it into a modern, you just try to not adapt it and just go into the DevOps world. Technical diagram on the safety beginning with you just smashing into a car and everything explodes. Uh, I didn't have Michael Bay's budget for this, so it could not actually explode with fire here, but it's what, it's what you get. Um, Cool, here's kind of the, these are not meant to be exhaustive, by the way, this is meant as, here's kind of select components of, these are kind of the, um, the primitives that we're all used to in terms of controls that we need in our SDLC, right? Whether that's developer training or threat modeling or design review, stack analysis, all the way through, right? Um, so which of these were constrained by time while we're in this room? So I'm not gonna talk about all of those. What I'm gonna talk about are the ones that are actually bolded here. Uh, this does not, I wanna be extremely explicit, uh, this does not mean you stop doing these other things. Uh, it just means as the function of being in a 40 minute time slot here today on stage, here's the five that we're actually gonna get through. So those are the ones I'm gonna focus on. These other ones, they don't go away. Um, they somewhat change, they somewhat don't, um, and we can talk about those hopefully next year. Uh, okay, so jumping into static analysis. Uh, how many people have lived through a, well, let me put it this way, actually. Last time I was on stage talking about this, I asked what was the, the largest static analysis report anybody has ever seen uh, in terms of just mountains of false positives, and I think the record that I've heard was like 9,000 issues from one run. Uh, what's the largest one that anyone has seen in here of static analysis? Yeah. 25, yes. <laughs> 25,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just you, you, you know, you, you plugged in Fortify, you hit go, and then you're like, oh my God, what have I done? Yeah. 100,000. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, the whiskey will be in the back soon. Don't worry. We've all, we've all been there. Um, so static analysis, how I'm gonna talk about all these sections, by the way, this is gonna be the same sort of format. It's, I'm gonna talk about the way in which we did them in kind of a legacy environment, and I'm gonna talk about how we adapt that control. Um, so static analysis has really traditionally been done as this very heavyweight process. Um, it's very, it's been very top down, right? It's that you, you buy a commercial static analysis, uh, or you try to get like an open source one, although I'm really you know, talking about quite a while ago here. So you bought like an early commercial one, you hit go, and you get this mountain of issues that, that come out of there. 
predominantly false positives, right? And so typically what, how you'd see that get adapted in organizations is that you'd run that once a week, once a month, um, you'd get this very large output, and the dirty secret of that is what you typically see is organizations where security ran that, and then they get the PDF output, and they hit forward on the email to the development team, and they're like, oh, sweet, the development team's totally going to dig through this and weed out all the real issues. Meanwhile, uh, meanwhile, back at the bat cave of development is that security just emailed another one of those attachments. Just if it says you know, static analysis in the title, just send it to spam. Uh, it's got 9,000 false positives in it, and I'm trying to ship features. Um, and we used to do that as this very top-down, right, turn everything on, and then let's spend 18 months actually making it work. Um, the truth slash sad truth is that this was sort of acceptable-ish in that environment. Because if, you, if you're releasing software every 18 months, and it takes you months to actually tune these systems, um, so, Let's say you, you drop one of these systems in place and it's going to take you 12 months to do it. Like, oh, actually, you're only really losing one development cycle there on that to, to get it going. It was acceptable-ish. Um, so how do we actually adapt this? So what we really do is we shift from this top-down heavyweight model to actually building bottoms up on this sort of model. So ideally, what you, the way in which you get started here, now to be very clear, uh, what you want to ideally, the ideal case that you get to here is that in both cases you kind of meet in the middle and you get good enough coverage where you've got good enough coverage that you're not really willing to invest more resources in tuning or anything like that and you're getting good bang for your buck. Uh, what changes in the kind of DevOps world here and CI, CD and Agile and everything like that is you don't start with a heavyweight system, you start from nothing. And you start to say, okay, here is the first vulnerability class that I care about. Let me turn something on for that and get it going. Um, so, and I'll give you practical examples of this on the next slides. But you really, the focus goes on enabling velocity and eliminating false positives rather than, um, rather than saying, oh, we're going to get coverage for everything theoretically, but in reality you're not. Um, so once you start with like one particular Vuln class, you get that going well, now you add a second, now you add a third, and you build bottoms up from there. Uh, this really enables the velocity that you need in a sort of DevOps environment to be able to actually run static analysis on every commit, right? where you're not running it once a month and then forwarding this heavyweight report. Um, so an example of that is you pick the easiest. Pick the easiest to start with. A lot of times that's actually command execution um, because often I put this in here semi-sarcastically of grepping for system has a low false positive rate. But the reality is like if you're looking for command execution to start, like there are fairly few paths to that and you're able to really build that very effectively where, oh, in our particular technology choices, this is what command execution can look like in this tech stack. Cool, here's the six things I actually just need to grep for. Great, bang, on to the next one. Now I can build up to more and more effective ones. Um, the focus is not only on findings. Uh, I think that this kind of, this is a trap that we tend to fall into as security is that just focus on the findings. The, the larger, because you can win the battle there but still lose the war of bringing this to your, your development program, which is you want to be able to demonstrate that this new approach to this control can actually function in this modern world. That when you're talking to your development teams or to your DevOps teams, say, hey, we've built this new approach uh, in terms of how we're thinking about static analysis as a control, it can actually function as quick as you need it to, and we're making, we're improving uh, the capabilities of it all the time. So right now, you're only gonna get reports if they're, stati if they're command execution. Uh, in two months, you're going to get them for SQL injection. Another month after that, for XSS. And you're going to keep building up. Um, you're going to keep building up the coverage that you're actually getting from these systems. And it allows you to demonstrate velocity and demonstrate that, yeah, this control, if we properly adapt it, actually still really has a place in our program. Um, continuing on with static analysis. So this is actually one of the, the longer sections of the, the five I'm going to talk about, which is that you can also start to do really effective things that are really dumb uh, in a lot of ways that are great because they are you can just grep for them or you can just do very simple checks that actually give you a ton of bang for your buck. So identifying certain primitives that rather than just being blocked, 
they should actually initiate a conversation with the security team. Right? If, you're, if you've got a development group that suddenly starts making use of encryption functions when they've never done that before, that should probably not be blocked, but it should drive a, a conversation with the security team of, hey, we noticed you're suddenly calling AES, or you know, worse, like somehow you started calling DES or something like that. Um, what are you? What are you actually building here? How can we be? How can we be helpful in this? And it's able to use this more as a alerting function to the security team that hey, there's something happening over here in the code base. Not necessarily it should be blocked, but it should drive a conversation. Um, so the the kind of old example of this that. I've seen in so many organizations is that, oh, we have static analysis checks that say if you try to introduce MD5 into the code base, you get blocked. Uh, but if you redo that as SHA-256, like, good to go. Um, that's not wrong. The problem is that that's not necessarily actually giving you the best bang for your buck of how you should be thinking about the particular application or the particular code. It's more just because you silently approved like a particular hashing function, uh, it doesn't help in the case where that's not actually the right thing that they should be doing, where they should have been encrypting the data instead of hashing it or anything like that. Right? So instead of using it just as a, a blank kind of policy that says this is blocked, this is allowed, you can still do that, but the real value is then saying on the stuff that's allowed, I want an alert about it happening in my code base so that I can drive conversations there and actually see what's happening with this particular team. Um, the final bit on this is really knowing when certain sensitive, just like knowing when something new is entering the code base, lots of times we're all dealing with huge legacy code bases, right? We're not dealing with brand new things that we just know what's going on already. Uh, but what you typically want to know out of this and what's really really useful is, hey, there are certain very sensitive portions of this code base, whether it's brand new or whether it's legacy. You want to know when they actually change. So much of the core sensitive business logic or authorization primitives or encryption wrappers or session management, right? you write that stuff once and then you never really need to update it that much. Maybe you're updating it to rotate keys or something like that. But if someone changes the like core session management of the way that you generate and store session cookies, uh, you probably want to know about that, right? And it might not, again, it might not be blocked. It might be a like a comment change or something like that. But you want to know that somebody is actually changing that part of your code base, code base because it almost never happens, right? So it's a really good signal to noise of somebody just changed the sensitive part of the code base. Let's actually drive a conversation off of it. Let's not just block this outright. All right, moving on to dynamic scanning. And I'm going to take a sip of water first. So now's your time to heckle and shout questions. I said anybody but Manica. <laughs> Do it. Let me Please. see if I got this right. So in, in order to allow my SaaS tools to be effective in the DevOps world, mm -hmm. I need to go buy these super expensive DevOps tools, neuter all of their major <laughs> capability down to one, maybe two small features, mm -hmm. and slowly amp it up over time, maybe. It, 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 I just, yeah. I, it seems like the neutering of, the, of, of a, an expensive, important tool. That's my only concern. It's the starting point. It's absolutely, if, if you're saying, if that was the end point, that, oh, you only, you buy this big expensive tool and you only turn it on for one thing, like that would not be useful whatsoever, right? Think of that as the starting point to the, the point that you want to get to. And you're starting from, I'm only going to introduce new pieces of it as they're effective versus I'm going to drown my developers in 50,000 false positives and I'm going to slowly turn that down to 1,000 false positives. Please. Yeah. Oh. One of the dimensions of neutering a SaaS tool to be effective in DevOps mm -hmm. is, to, is to turn down um, likelihood, like, like low likelihood. Volume. Totally. Yeah. And, and so th those are never welcome in a DevOps environment. Totally. So I'm just saying is, should we be augmenting our DevOps with out of band manual work still, or is the idea to get rid of all of it? I'm, I, I just worry so, some of the neutering of SaaS tools, mm -hmm. I'm going to lose fidelity. Totally. I think that depending on your SaaS tool, I think you bring up a really good point, which is that depending on your individual technology choice there, it might not be that you turn down all the categories and you start with one and then you go to a second, you go to a third. It might be exactly as you described. You turn it so that it's only extremely high confidence across all your categories and then you work into, you know, from 
super high confidence to high confidence to medium to low. It's more the idea here rather than the you have to. It, this is not prescriptive of you have to go Voln class by Voln class. It's start with high confidence, whether you're doing that Voln class by Voln class or by confidence rating, and build up. Right, build bottoms up instead of top down, on, YOLO on for everything, and then we'll get there from there. Yeah. I have a related question, which is I, I think what you said, I, I've seen it work, especially for things that aren't already pr uh, present pervasively in the code base. Mm -hmm. There's only one example, you can fix it, and then you can turn on this thing that closes the tree. But, like, let's say it's not a false positive problem. You've got an incredibly effective rule, but there's 300 instances of the code base. Totally. Totally. Uh, so I'm going to repeat it for the mic and everything there and yell at me if I screw it up. It's that what I was at first describing there seems very effective for either a new code base or a legacy code base that has very low instances of particular issues. But then if you're dealing with a legacy code base that has a ton of instances uh, or there's just a number of them in there, like how does this fall over? Is that yeah. fair? Okay. Absolutely, because I've run into the same issues, which is that what you do on that case is you've got a backlog at that point. And so the way that I found that to be most effective is you turn on this rule and say, okay, I'm going to alert off of new instances. I've now got a backlog of, you said like 300, I've got a backlog of 300 that I'm going to weed through reviews on those and see if there were real issues there or that was whatever. Um, but you separate it out to say, here's how I've got an effective control from this point forward. And here's my backlog of work. And I add it to my mountain of backlog of work with everything else. And I'm going to prioritize that appropriately. But yeah, it's not something where you say, okay, it's only once I get through this backlog that I introduce this or anything there, you, you separate the work into different piles. Does that, does that make sense? Cool. Yes. The tree's closed. Hundred, hundred percent. Yeah, exactly. New, yep. Totally agree. Totally agree. Uh, Matt. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and just immediately block on commit out of tool output. Yeah, totally. That's. Exactly. If output of random tool is more than zero block code commit, yeah, that's a, that's a good recipe to be finding a new place of employment very quickly, probably. <laughs> One would hope. Uh, dynamic scanning. This section is super short, actually, which is that I think that I'll give you it in the, the TLDR right up front, which is that I think dynamic scanning, DAST, like, shifts from where we used to be able to use it as an, a semi-effective control to try to do vuln discovery to now it's much better suited for really policy enforcement. I'll get into what I mean on that. Right? It used to be this kind of baseline of run the scanner. If it finds issues, like we should probably fix that. You see organizations occasionally misuse that as pen testing and saying, oh, no, we ran a scanner, so like, we're not going to do pen testing. Um, how does this actually adapt? It really, the problem is that application architecture has changed so radically since the early to mid 2000s of when these sort of, this technology was built that modern apps are really far too complex to get that sort of coverage anymore. I'm not saying it's impossible by any means. I am saying that in terms of bang for the buck, right, we're all underwater in our jobs in terms of the amount of security projects we need to do. Your, bang for, your best bang for your buck is elsewhere than trying to like teach DAST tools, how to effectively crawl your now, you know, written in React client side app that it can't really understand. Um, the old case, there's just, there's not as much value there anymore. What is actually valuable here is that ensuring that security policies are actually being enforced, right? We set for this app, we've rolled out TLS. Uh, if you, a dynamic scanner, run and see if you ever find a link inside this domain that's pointing to HTTP, I want to know about that immediately. Uh, I want to know that I've invested a ton in CSP. I want to see if I ever hit pages where CSP is not actually being set uh, or the X-Frame options header or any of my security policies are not being met. That's a very cheap but effective use of dynamic scanning. Um, and the second is really around regressions that, okay, I had a, let's take a completely... Um, 
you know, cliche example, I had XSS in the search box. Uh, well, I'm going to make sure to point my dynamic scanning. In addition to all the unit testing and other regression testing I'm doing, this is just a cheap additional control on that to say, hey, hit this page, post this parameter, and if you ever get JavaScript back, like flag that as a regression right there. Um, it becomes very effective in that sort of that sort of use case. All right, moving on to security visibility. If you don't follow Honest on Status Page on Twitter, by the way, it is. It is painfully accurate, um, which is just searching for your name and down and then alerting, oh, our service is probably down. Um, the amount of face palms I've seen from that, that Twitter is great. Um, OK, so the way that visibility used to really work um, is that we really had all of these different siloed pieces of data, whether that was logs, whether that was customer service reports or outages or anything like that. And each source of information was really isolated. Right? So ops maybe had logs and customer support dealt with angry customers that said, your third page of your checkout flow is not loading and I can't buy anything. Um, and then devs would get paged for certain outages or on call or anything like that. Um, how do we adapt this control? It's that this is where we take a complete, we don't have to relearn this lesson ourselves. This is what DevOps had to learn in its infancy, is that the way in which DevOps actually became very effective was a cliche alert again, but it was about breaking down the silos between these pieces of the organization so that they would all have their relevant context and they could move quicker as a result. Security is going through the same realization right now that this is what we need to do, is that break down these silos between the different pieces of the organization so that security can empower them and security can have the context from those pieces of the organization to really know what's going on. Um, I'll give you an example of this, which is, so let's say you have a graph of 500 errors from your application, and you see a big spike in that. This provokes wildly different responses from your dev team, which is like, oh, the intern pushed to prod, uh, looks like stuff's broken, uh, to the DevOps team, which is like, oh, God, why am I being paged again, uh, to security, which is like, uh, maybe that's somebody actually discovering a valid bug in the app and triggering errors to your attackers or your pen testers who are like, I am definitely discovering a bug in your app and exploiting it. Um, it's different. Everybody has different context on this. And the real lesson learned out of this is start to match this up with different sets of data from around the organization so that everybody can look at this and get this sort of visibility and this context, right? When you can bring different pieces of context of operational development, security data together and provide that visibility, now everybody that looks at this together can start to have the context of what's going on. Um, I'm, bringing, I'm bringing Office Space memes back. It's like 17 years old now, so I feel incredibly old, um, but I don't feel bad putting a 17-year-old meme on a slide. Why not? Um, Feedback. So typically how we did feedback was as pen tests, um, and that was typically done annually, right? You'd run the pen test. It really answered for you, do I have bugs? Uh, spoiler alert, yes, you always have bugs, right? They're, they're always going to exist. Um, the, the thing is that when we were on 12-month, 18-month release cycles, again, acceptable-ish enough um, because if you're running a pen test every 12 months and you're releasing every 18, you're getting some actual feedback there. How do we adapt this control? Um, and this is, I'm gonna talk about bug bounties a little bit here, is that bug bounty um, really becomes, I'm very excited about bug bounty stuff. We, we launched one back at Etsy when there was none of the like hacker one or, or a bug crowd or any of the really cool services around it um, and lost probably three weeks of sleep because of that. Um, but it's really effective. I think the key to note here is that this is not a replacement for other controls. It has really strong pros and cons, just like all of your other controls. And what I really like is that the, the combination of bug bounty and pen tests gives you this nice kind of sweet spot of coverage around testing there. It's that the real value, uh, in my opinion, of bug bounties is in the continuous nature of it, that you always have some testing going on there, that you're, you're probably not getting the direct, well, you're definitely not getting the direction of your, your pen tests. Whether you're getting the depth of them is a different question, and that's totally up for argument. But the value of 
how you can use them in conjunction is to say, hey, for my pen tests, I'm going to use them on this pre-release feature, or I want them to focus on this deep and dark, scary bit of the code base over here that nobody else ever looks at. I can actually direct my pen tests very effectively. Uh, whereas with Bounty, I can get this nice overall coverage, and it's continuous there. And it gives me much more real-time feedback in terms of where I should be focusing my efforts. Um, I'm going to pause for a second and take a breath. And any questions so far on, on this part or heckling or trolling? Cool. We'll come back to it. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So I think what shifts there, so the question and the comment, correct me where I'm wrong, was uh, since launching Bounty and then continuing your pen test program, you're getting much less signal from your pen test program after a Bounty launch. Is that fair? Okay. So I think, I think that the key there where I've seen, because yeah, if you're still doing your pen testing as like kind of the general sanity check, which is how we've really used pen testing in the past, I completely agree. I think the value of that goes down. I think where the value of pen testing stays the same or increases or decreases, depending on how you're looking at it, uh, is in the specific direction of it. It's, hey, pen testers, don't give me an overall assessment of this. I want you to focus on this area because I don't feel like I'm getting coverage of that from my bounty or from the other assessment that's going on. And that, the kind of highly directional nature of that, whether that's in you want to put that on particular pre-release software or something there, right? whether it's direction because it's not out yet, or it's direction because we've been running this bounty program for two years, and we've never seen an issue in this piece, even though we've run bonuses and everything there, because guess what? It's like five layers deep inside an API, and it's a complete pain to actually test it, and none of my bounty people really care. I can actually direct my pen testers there because I have a real contractual relationship with them. Does that make sense? I think, um, I think the only thing there um, is can't, can't I do something similar by, can't, can't I steer my bounty program with treasure maps and what have you? Totally. And get the same output? I'm just trying to figure I, out, it's starting to feel, for me anyway, it's starting yeah. to feel like it's very duplicated effort. Totally. No, I think, I think it's going to depend on your environment. I think that, I think that we're seeing the sort of treasure map stuff and I'm super excited about that, honestly. Like, I, I think that's a really cool use of bounties and how you start to incentivize it. I still think at the end of the day, your relationship with your bounty researchers versus your relationship with your pen testers is going to fundamentally be a different one and that you can more you can direct your pen testers more effectively. Now, given your environment, it might be the case that, yeah, you can direct them just as a, you can direct your researchers just as well via a treasure map because, you know, it's not actually complex to test this part. It's just no one knew to test it versus this part is super complex to test. And actually, we can't really get any bounty researchers to look at it. So I'm going to hire specialized pen testers for it. Right. I think it's there's no prescriptive. Oh, it's this is the hard line between the two. Right. I, I think that that's why they're so exciting is that they're blurring the line between each other, but that each, I think, properly used still has a lot of value. Is that fair? Yeah, I play cool. devil's advocate a little bit. Yeah, please, <laughs> totally. I have, a, I have a hardware component in my product set. Yeah. For that one, there's nothing but pen testing that works because it just yeah. doesn't scale to send hardware to everybody else. <laughs> totally. Yeah. totally, yep. Cool. All right, let's go for some uh, future thinking thought leadership via the thought leader hosen. Um, and this is where... Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thought Ops 2017, right there. Um, this is really thoughts on how do we, what is future looking in terms of how we really make effective application security programs moving forward? Um, the hallmark of a modern application security program is the combination of this sort of continuous feedback combined with continuous visibility. Um, the other way to think about it from the actual attacker like the attack driven defense sort of approach here is that to be successful against real attackers, which is who we're up against, uh, you need to be able to answer the question, how do I know when my attackers are being successful? Right? I need to know when my attackers are successful before Brian Krebs calls me for comment. Um, that is not typically a good thing. Um, the three real, having lived through a lot of this, the, the three pillars of effective visibility and continuous feedback that 
I've really seen be effective are that it's the ability to detect attackers as early as possible in the attack chain, right? You don't want to be detecting them at exfil time because uh, you've got a pretty big problem there and you're probably not detecting their full exfil or anything like that. You want to know if you break down the attack chain from the offensive perspective of, you know, recon to vuln discovery to payload refinement to actual exploitation to CNC and then grabbing data and moving laterally and exfilling, you want to now run that from the defensive perspective to be able to say, for each of these components of the attack chain, how do I have the ability to detect someone here? And the, the reality is when you start looking at it through that lens, you're like, actually, I don't have anything here or here or here. And then when you start to actually take your next step, which is how do I start to run attack simulations here, whether that's via pen test or bounties or attack simulations or anything like that, you find out that the area that you thought you had a lot of visibility in, you actually don't. Um, it's really the more that we can be kind of testing our controls here, the more effective we can actually make them. So that's really into the second piece, which is the ability to test and continuously test and uh, refine your triage and your response is key. You know, the first time that you're dealing with, it's like fire drills, right? The, the first time that you're ever, if the first time you're ever running out of a building is because it's on fire, like you're gonna have a really bad time. Um, but if you've walked out of the exit like a dozen times before, you're like, oh, that's where it is. I'm gonna actually like, this is, this is just another day of, of dealing with this. Um, the, the beauty of DevOps, and this is why when I talked at the beginning, I alluded to, hey, I really view embracement of cloud and DevOps and just moving faster is actually a, a net positive on security, is that it for the first time, we can actually move faster than attackers. Right? This is the first time that we've really had this capability. If you think about kind of a waterfall methodology where we released every 18 months and we requested servers from the sysops group and they gave them to them four years later, uh, like we could not move fast. And so even if we detected somebody, we really couldn't do anything about it. Now with DevOps, like we can actually change the game out from under attackers. And I'm gonna show you a quote uh, in a minute on like what that can actually look like successfully. Um, the third bit is the ability to continuously test and refine your incident response and your DFIR and SecOps and everything like that. Um, the beauty here is if you're running a bounty program or a pen test or however issues come up, treat those as if they were incidents and say, okay, we're going to run this one, this, uh, you know, this business logic issue that just came in or the SQL injection that just came in. We're going to run this as if it was a it wasn't reported, somebody actually was exploiting us via it, and let's actually run this as a scenario, and let's say, how do we know, how can we answer the question, did they, did anybody else exploit this? Did that particular actor exploit anything else against us? Like, has this been used? Has data been compromised because of it? And how could we, when we're in the middle of investigating, and we were like, oh, we need to pull this data set, oh, that data set doesn't exist, how can we run that scenario so that we can get better and better processes here where we can say, okay, I'm going to need this sort of data set for any incident like this, and here's how I'm gonna to need to be able to interact with it, here's who I'm gonna need in the room, I need two people from that team, two people from that team, two people from that team, here's how we're gonna communicate, you know, in band or out of band, and it's a process that you've run before, before there's a real incident. Um, this was one of the, I put that question there, I'm on camera, so I'll keep it a little vague, um, but we've seen issues, I've seen issues in the past where had this sort of visibility in place, and we watched an attacker discover an issue, and we know that it wasn't like a tool or something like that. We watched them discover an issue and confirm exploitability of it, and then not use it and just go away and never report it. And that was one of the scariest moments in my AppSec career, actually, was watching that and then just kind of setting a trigger on it. For six months, we watched and we're like, are they going to show back up and do something here? Like, what? Why did they just throw that and save that for later? Uh, and what is actually happening here? Um, and you want the ability to have this sort of visibility to say, hey, did they find something else? Did somebody else find this? What's actually going on here? Um, I'm gonna give an example from Etsy just because it was there at the time so I can actually use their name and everything like this. Um, but this was a different scenario where, and you can look it up on that Reddit thread. It was really, it was really awesome, uh, which is that we got to live both sides of it where this was one of our, at the time we thought attackers, uh, turned out to be an awesome uh, bounty researcher, but it was before we had a bounty program. Um, and they, they wrote up this thread and they said, uh, I discovered this issue on Friday afternoon and I wasn't ready to email it in to them. And 
the timing's actually a little bit off, but what happened is that we detected their requests and pushed a fix before they actually had reported it to us. So we went, what happened, as you read the thread, is we went to uh, you know, confirm the POC again before we emailed it in the next morning, and it wasn't working anymore. And we got this email from them that was like, hey, so I'm a white hat. I do all my testing from my home IP. We're not going to get all lawsuity, right? Um, and they're like, no, no, check your, check your account, actually. We emailed you in the middle of your testing and said, hi there. Uh, we see you. Do you see anything like? Here's our email, here's our contact email, give us a shout. Um, and it was a really cool interaction there in terms of, I think this is a success story to be thinking the, the lens of modern AppSec through, which is how do we get this sort of visibility to know when our adversaries are actually being successful? Because we need this capability to drive it back into the development teams and the DevOps teams to actually make them self-sufficient. So the end is actually near, congrats, you've made it this far. Um, really the, the thesis of this to kind of put it a different way is that the, the old waterfall model is this exclusive focus on heavy gatekeeping controls to try to eliminate all bugs before code is deployed. Um, that's not wrong, it's just an impossible goal, but all, co all bugs are not going to be eliminated before code goes to production, otherwise none of us would be in this room. Um, the way in which we actually shift our approach here is to focus on obtaining and refining continuous visibility and feedback from deployed applications, and using that to make development teams, DevOps teams, and security teams security self-sufficient. So you're awesome for making it here after lunch. Thank you so much. I think we have about, yeah, we have seven minutes, it looks like, for questions. Please, let's do them. Anybody, I know someone's got something. Yeah, here, Jimmy. Take the mic. Please. Great talk, by the way. Um, how do you find the intersection of kind of legacy governing bodies such as PCI and <laughs> what other three letter words um, yep. interacting with this new approach to DevOps and security moving fast? I, kind of challenging, I found in the past year when we started totally. moving towards this sort of continuous deployment. And yeah. Even bug bounties are not always easy to explain. Totally. Um, and I'll, I'll actually pull that question even wider, which is talk about it through the lens of compliance or regulatory constrained environments, right? Uh, there's no magic answer to that one at all. Uh, having lived through some of that, it's that, I may give a very high level answer here, honestly, is that the nice thing is that the embracement of DevOps and cloud and CI, CD and everything like that, it's no longer six hipster internet companies doing it. Uh, it is pick an industry and you're gonna find the people in there doing it. And audit, just kind of by definition, tends to lag what the current environment looks like. So what I've found effective there is as you're talking with your auditors or you know regulators or anything there is really, they're very used to for the most part, I don't want to overgeneralize, but for the most part, they're very used to driven like, hey, here's the item in the spreadsheet. It says this, like, do you do this, yes or no? And the more that you can push back to auditors and say, what is the underlying thing that you're trying to actually secure here? Or what is, you know, forget your question, right? What is the, what is the attack that you're trying to mitigate? What is the, like, why do you want this control in place? Oh, you want that, here's how we do that. It's different than your question, here's how you exactly mitigate. It. Now, the answer is that like, some auditors that flies with. Some they're like, nope, it's this cell in the spreadsheet and it needs to be yes or no. Um, that's getting better. I don't think it's gonna get better overnight. And I think that especially in environments where you can choose your auditors, that's how you interview your auditors is say, hey, I'm looking for someone that is actually trying to help us meet our compliance obligations and actually trying to meet the underlying goals and not just read off a spreadsheet. Cool, please. If you're a Sec DevOps noob like me, are there any other resources that we should check out to kind of jump in? Probably most of the talks here. Um, yeah, I think there's, uh, that's been something that's really exciting, I think, is that so many, so much cool material has been coming out the last couple of years uh, on this of kind of, you know, pick your smattering of a bunch of the internet companies that really published early on about this, right? You know, Facebook, Etsy, Google, Squared, like Netflix, all the the, the cool ones there, Dropbox. Um, 
now you're starting to see ones come out, I think, from different verticals as well, which is really cool. So, you know, as you're in financial services, you're seeing like cloud groups spring up in financial services and everything there, where four years ago, they're like, no, we're, fi we're financial services, we never touch cloud. Uh, and now you come back to that and they're like, oh yeah, I mean, our system of record is never gonna go to cloud, but we're seeing like our new web applications or mobile applications tend to be in that environment. Um, so that answer was super light on specifics. So what I will say is if you want to drop me an email, I'm happy to send you like stuff I've seen that was really cool. But from a high level, I think more and more is being published and that's awesome. Please. Yeah. And then you're up next. <laughs> Yeah, so you touched on the fact that um, a lot of the really cutting edge companies are doing this first. Mm -hmm. But if you're consulting for a very large company that's got like 10, 20,000 developers, and you're like, hey, the wave of the future is uh, you empower your developers. And they're able to push production whenever they want because mm -hmm. you trust them. Um, you'll get a very strange reaction. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because that in, in a very large company, that culture just doesn't exist of totally. trusting the developer. And here's, here's the crazy part, and I w wonder what you think about this. It's a different quality of developer, okay? Potentially, right? So the people that Facebook and Netflix mm -hmm. and Riot Games and all these other people, they're hiring for this responsibility and for this trust and like, they, they just have a very high quality. So. What do you say to the larger orgs with 20,000 developers? Hey, you just need to change how you hire devs and they need to be higher quality and they, you need to be able to trust them. Sure. I think that what, I'm, what I've seen in exactly the sort of enterprise environment that you talk about is that this isn't a change that happens overnight and it doesn't happen all at once, right? It doesn't happen that fast and it doesn't happen across the entire development organization, what you see in environments like that typically is that here is that one most forward leaning team and they're gonna start to toe in the water with cloud or DevOps or anything like that. And the beauty of that approach is that uh, that's how they kind of are able to learn the case study of how it's gonna work here, right? It's not just, for all the stuff that's published, it's awesome. The more that we can learn from each other and help each other out, we're all facing the same problems. Like, that's fantastic, but there's always gonna be slight tweaks on how it works inside your particular organization. And so, what I really see with ones like that is, whether it's via an acquisition, or just via a team that, hey, they're the one that was tasked with building the mobile app, or whatever, there's always this kind of one, at least one forward-leaning team Team, they start to embrace these principles first and you see it flow from there into how do we now how do we now go to the second tier teams or the third tier teams or anything like that and what are the lessons learned along the way if someone said oh we're gonna turn a 20,000 person dev shop to CICD tomorrow I'd be like you're insane but I think it's I think it's fuzzy. I think there's a lot of I think there's a lot of lessons that we can learn for each organization there that say, "Hey, here's how we retrain and retool people for this sort of, right? This is a a shift in the job and how do we make them effective at that?" Um, I think that's how we should be focused on that rather than just cutting off parts of the development organizations. How do we actually enable folks there? Um, I'm now being thrown off stage. So thank you so much for everybody and uh, Dev and Emily are up next and it looks awesome. Let's stick around.